First of all, I would like to uh, thank very much uh, Karl Reber for the uh, for the invitation to uh, join this uh, uh, meeting here today, and uh, Tobias for all the uh, organizational uh, work that he has uh, done to uh, accomplish this um, this session. The cultic landscape of the Karistia is relatively well known, although not in great detail. For a brief overview of cult places, we may single out the famous sanctuary of Poseidon at Eurystos, especially known for literary sources, to begin with Homer's Odyssey, the cult place associated with Hera on top of Mount Archi, to which the enigmatic dragon's house can be possibly associated, the small temple in the settlement of Agampolis and the extra-urban temple at Platanistos Elenikor. And the sanctuaries of Plakari and Karababa, west of modern Karistos, that are the topic of the present paper. In addition, to, in addition to these, a number of small rural sanctuaries have been identified in regional surveys. Of the temples that the classical and Hellenistic polis of Karistos must have housed, we know next to nothing. The sanctuary at Plakari was as investigated between 2010 and 2015 as part of a multidisciplinary research project combining systematic excavations with geological landscape research, paleoecology, archaeobotany, zooarchaeology, and the study of marine faunal remains. The Caralaba sanctuary and its associated procession road were researched as part of a diagronic regional study of land and sea connections in the Caristia between 2016 and 2019. Both projects were carried out as a collaboration between the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam and the Ephorate of Antiquities of Eubea. In my presentation, I will reflect on the development of the Plakari Sanctuary, its functioning, its relation to the Karababa Sanctuary, and finally, I will comment briefly upon how the southern part of the island fits in the wider cultic landscape, uh, landscape uh, picture of Yabia. The southern part of Yabia was probably uninhabited during the larger part of the late Bronze Age. After some three or four centuries, the earliest signs of reoccupation of the region come from the Plakari sanctuary. The earliest finds here belong to the sub mycenaean period and consist of six symmetrical arch fibulae with twisted bow, three violin bow fibulae, as well as three sub mycenaean dress pins. The earliest datable pottery can be identified as early to middle proto geometric. And since Placari is the, for a long time, the only uh, early Iron Age site in the region, we think that it can be identified with early Iron Age and archaic Karistos. Theoretically, it is possible that Plakari started off in the 11th century BC as a hilltop sanctuary and only during the 8th century, when we have the first settlement evidence, became the location of a local community that continued to use the hilltop as a cult place. Such a scenario is not very plausible, however, as it supposes that during the first two centuries of its existence, this cult site would have been literally in the middle of nowhere, considering that the nearest human presence in the proto-geometric period was probably found on the opposite coast of Attica. Of interest in this connection are the chance finds of a gold finger ring and an earring datable to the early 9th century, possibly the remains of a disturbed tomb near the northwest axis of the Plakari hilltop. If these items indeed originate from a destroyed grave, we can push the earliest evidence for people living and dying on the flanks of the Plakari hilltop back to the later 10th or early 9th century BC, which makes the chronological cap gap considerably narrower. Let us first consider the development of the cult place and its layout during uh, subsequent phases. Most of the earliest material found in the sanctuary was part of the so-called sacrificial refuse area, 
an open-air deposit lying to the south of the sanctuary's upper terrace. The sac this sacrificial refuse area contained large amount of animal bones, charcoal, ceramics, and small finds, identifiable as votive offerings, dating, dating from the 11th to 6th century BC. At some point before the mid-7th century, a long wall running north-south was constructed on, constructed on the hilltop, and that's the red wall on the plan. Delineating a terrace or an open space to its east. During a following phase, perhaps in the later 7th century, a peribolus or terrace wall retaining a large stone fill was constructed, and that these are the brown walls on the plan. In the southern part of this terrace, a semicircular stone altar was built in the 6th century, and that's the yellow structure for B on the plan. Inside and next to this structure, we found burned bones and other burned material, an iron hook and a number of iron knives, probably used for butchering sacrificial animals, a bronze fiale mesomphalos, a large iron thrusting spear, a terracotta rattle in the form of a bird, and a bronze her horse figurine, suggesting that this was the focal point for a variety of rituals taking place in the open air. At some point in the Classical period, presumably around 400 BC, the sanctuary was restructured and partly rebuilt. A monumental entrance or gateway building was constructed, providing access to an open space which was enlarged, probably to accommodate larger group of cult attendants. On the upper terrace, so it is here again. On the upper terrace, which may be considered to be the most sacred part of the sanctuary, a small building was constructed or rebuilt, and a forecourt was laid out, covering earlier cultic structures. A small building, which you see on the lower uh, left-hand side, the small building probably functioned as a pantry and storeroom for precious and sometimes antique items. Let us now continue with a brief overview of cult and cult practices. It seems that right from the start, the Peccary hilltop was reserved for cultic activities. Already during the, 9th to, uh, the 11th to 9th century, communal eating and drinking and the dedication of photos were part of the cult activities. During the 8th century, we see an intensification of cult activities at Peccary. The sacrificial refuse area, already mentioned, yielded some 33,000 pottery fragments, over 26,000 fragments of animal bones, and more than 430 small finds. The majority of the pottery dates to the Middle Geometric II and Late Geometric periods. Dr. Xenia Gatalambidu, who studies the ceramics for publication, reports that the painted fine wares, among which many imports from Attica, represent the whole range of vessels needed to transport, store, mix, distribute and consume wine on a considerable scale and probably on frequent occasions. We assume that a large part of the animal bones are to be associated with this same phase of increased cultic activity. Most of the identifiable, identifiable animal bones belong to sheep or goats, 80%, followed at a distance by cattle, 8.5%, and pigs, 0.3%. Of the sheep goat fragments, only a small portion, 6.5%, were burned. Most of these burned fragments were from the femur and lower part of the tail which matches with what later literary and iconographic sources tell us about the god's portion. The much larger percentage of unburned bones suggests that most of the meat was cooked before consumption, probably by those attending the sacrifices. 
Many of the votive offerings found in the sacrificial refuse area and elsewhere in the sanctuary area were broken or, in the case of metal objects, bent or folded. A case in point uh, is the body fragment of a male spherolaton figurine. Together with the numerous pottery fragments, this suggests that objects that were used in rituals or offered uh, in the sanctuary were ritually destroyed before deposition. Locally produced terracotta figurines of helmeted figures, horses, bovines, and a wheel of a vehicle may reflect the interests or indeed the lifestyle of part of the male population. More numerous are in fact uh, votives that belong to the female sphere. And there are a number of reasons to hypothesize. This is still some of the male items, a shield strap and a bronze collar from the fourth century, which has a parallel in the so-called tomb of Philip II in Virginia. Okay. Um, and we have a number of reasons to uh, hypothesize that these uh, photos that can be associated with the female sphere were, were dedicated as part of life cycle rituals. The small building A, dating to the classical period that we already mentioned, was destroyed probably by fire in 325 BC. This event marked the end of all cult activities at Plackery. But this unfortunate course of events also meant that the building's entire inventory was preserved. It provides us with a large and diverse collection of mainly local pottery, incense burners and lamps, most probably used for feasting. Much of this material was painstakingly reassembled by Phyllis Sangu in charge of the fine processing. Some of the vessels carry inscriptions, which Dr. Maria Hidirugul will discuss later today in a paper. But let me single out one that has a monogram of the letters Alpha P, already shown also by Athena, um, possibly referring to Apollo, who may have been one of the, male, um, the main uh, deities venerated at Placary. Let me now turn to the sanctuary of Karababa. The Karababa Hill lies opposite of Plakari, overlooking a valley with probably ancient agricultural terraces. The sanctuary is situated at about 220 meters above sea level, a little sea level, a little under the crest of the hill, and has full view of the Plakari sanctuary, as can be seen on this uh, view uh, shared on uh, the uh, left. Dr. Donald Keller, in his survey during the late 1970s, had already identified some vestiges that indicate the presence of a cold place. However, thanks to a combined pedestrian and drone survey, and with a little help from a wildfire in 2016, and I should say we have nothing to do with that, we have been able to identify more structures and reconstruct the general layout of the sanctuary. Like Plakari, the Karababa uh, sanctuary was an open-air cult place. It contained several stone-built platforms, some incorporating outcroppings of the natural rock, as well as one or two semicircular stone-built structures, reminiscent of the one at Placary that we have identified as, a altar, as an altar. And that's the one over there. In the south, part of a threshing floor has been identified from the air and on the ground. Within its center, a rectangular feature. It was built on the same terrace at platform A and the semicircular feature slash altar, which may indicate that this threshing floor is ancient. Also, it lies, uh, also it lies um, within the confines of the sanctuary, 
But during our survey, we found in two places rock inscriptions, Omicron Rho on one side and Yota Epsilon on the other, probably indicating Horos Yeru, that is, boundary of the sanctuary. And let me point out once more the location of these two Horos inscriptions. And so both, both read um, or on one side and uh, EA on the other, Clear, clearly uh, indicating where the boundary of the sanctuary was, and it was so to say. In the fields between Plakari and Karababa, we know that rows of stones uh, set on their site in the ground, apparently marking a road. And perhaps you can see a series of them there. On the basis of a combined drone and pedestrian survey using mobile devices running an ArcGIS application to manipulate factorized features and synchronize remote sensing and survey data, we could identify various road segments and finally reconstruct the road system that appeared to connect Plakari with the Karababa sanctuary. This road that we interpret as a procession way runs along the northeast side of the terraced area, then takes a westward turn along the north side of the terraced area to arrive at the Karababa sanctuary. This is the trajectory that the road takes. The terrace area is enclosed by a long and substantial boundary wall, preserved in some places up to one meter high. And that's the green wall that you see over there. It is especially well visible on this combined drone auto photo. Part of it also delineates the sanctuary in the north, and for this reason, we think that the area that closes uh, can be identified as sacred land. According to contemporary epigraphic evidence, rural and other sanctuaries frequently possessed such tamanoi, which they used or leased out to private persons to finance sacrifices and other cult activities. And I think that uh, Athena has uh, excavated uh, such a lease uh, in Paleochora which also is about, uh, which also concerns um, a sacred land. And so it shows that uh, this was also practiced in the area. On the basis of the layout of the sanctuary and the connected road system, we think that Karababa was a rural sanctuary on the edge of Plakari's catchment's area. The presence of a threshing floor may indicate that it was dedicated to Demeter, an association that we also find in the literary record. So sanctuaries and um, threshing floors. Surface pottery found within the Karababa sanctuary and in structures associated with the road date to the later cake to Hellenistic period, which shows that uh, the sanctuaries and roads coexisted and were part of the same cultic landscape. Now to sum up some differences and similarities with um, sanctuaries in the central part of the island. That is very clear that, like at Eretia, communal eating and drinking was very important, especially in the 8th century. Um, but there are also a number of very clear differences. And one is, of course, the um, development, the early installation of a cold place, perhaps even an urban cold place, urban um, with hyphenation, um, in, um, on the Plakari hilltop, and that has everything to do with the particular sediment history, continuity in the central part, and um, a break in occupation in the, uh, in the south part of the island, uh, resulting in a re-establishment of a settlement um, in uh, the sub myzonine period. Another thing is that uh, at least three centuries in the south uh, seem to be open air cold places, apart from this very small building at Plakari, and there was no uh, temple building on the site. And there are also a couple of uh, specific features in at both Plakari 
Karababa and Mount Ahi, like these semi-circular features, probably altars that are very uncommon um, in, in Greece, that, that shape, but and that have been attested in these uh, three uh, centuries. And we also see both at uh, Karababa and at Plakari, and maybe Ahi as well, that these sanctuaries are not only open air sanctuaries, but they also incorporate uh, rock outcroppings and all kinds of rocky features, sometimes with um, uh, ledges or uh, niches cut into them. It seems that rocky things were important uh, for these, uh, these cold places, and many, many of them are also on high ground. And so that seems to be a characteristic of uh, Christian cold places, uh, which makes them different from things happening in the south. Thank you very much.